but, but it, is, it is our springtime. Has anyone noticed that we're in the season of change, spring, season of new life? If you drive out through the countryside, who's seen lambs prancing around in the fields and, and everything starts to grow, cherry blossoms, uh, you know, all that stuff that we know and, and brings a smile to our face. Um, I think, you know, that, that season of new life. And, and there's also within us that, that sort of, I don't know if it's excitement or anticipation, that summer's on its way. You begin to, you know, the days are getting a little bit longer. You have this one Sunday, which is the worst Sunday of the year, where you lose an hour uh, and, you know, everything, your clocks go move forward and you lose that hour. That's a bit annoying. But, but we're excited because the days are getting longer. And around the country, not so much in Wellington, but, but you know, you feel that things are getting a bit warmer. Um, and uh, so it is a good season. It's, a, it's an exciting season to be in. And, I, and there are parallels, I think, you know, my own spirit, with what God is doing in our midst. You know, this is a, this is a season for us, I believe, where of, of change, of God wanting to do a new thing, of, you know, moving into a time of new life and our own journey with him, but also as a church, as a spiritual family, believing that, you know, God has not finished with us yet. Amen. God is not finished with us yet, that greater things are yet to come. You know, we've got to believe within us that, that our best days are still before us in God. Yeah? We've got to believe that. Our best days are still before us in God. It's really important that we believe that he hasn't finished with us, that, that there are still greater things ahead. Why? Because what we believe will influence and determine the way we live. What we believe affects our behavior. And so we've got to believe, you know, if we believe that greater things are still to come, if the best is still before us, then we begin to live in such a way that we're moving towards that because we believe it. Our belief determines our behavior. But the other extreme is we might believe that, oh, you know, it's all doom and gloom, you know, nothing good is on the horizon, that all we can hope for is, you know, Jesus to come and rapture his church and deliver us from all that's going on. You know, if we believe that, we'll begin to live. Um, uh, to, to reflect what we think and believe. So it's important that we believe, you know, that even our, in our own personal journey with God, that, that the best is yet to come in your own walk with God, that there's still good ahead for you as a follower of Jesus. Jesus. And, uh, you know, and that's even scriptural. Did you know that? Philippians 1 verse 6, one of my favorite verses says, He who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion. First good thing is that he started something good in you. You know, that's something to celebrate this morning. If, you, if you're a follower of Jesus today, if you've given your life to him, God started something good in you. He started something good. And he will carry that on to completion. In other words, what he started in you, that good work he started in you, he's going to carry it on. It doesn't say he might. It doesn't say that, you know, like it's a maybe if he gets around to it. He will carry on the good work that he started in you. In other words, he hasn't finished with you yet. There's still more. And it's like the good that he started, he's going to bring more good. There's going to be these layers of good, good upon good, because he's a good God and he's carrying on the good work he started. And so it's like glory to glory to glory. And then we're in his glorious presence for all of eternity. It's just good upon good and then eternity with him. So we should be smiling this morning. Who's excited about God? The God we follow, he's a good God. And he started something good in us, and he's going to keep uh, building on that as we journey with him. So it's important that we believe this stuff because, you know, our living is a reflection of what we're believing. And so let's believe um, that God has got good things ahead. Last Sunday morning, I, um, I shared a couple of scriptures with you. One of them is John chapter 13, verse 35. And this is, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, his followers. Back then it was a group of men and women that, you know, wherever Jesus went, they followed him around. They believed in him. They, they uh, just uh, were, were uh, you know, uh, wholehearted followers of Jesus of the day. But this group of people with Jesus, they were the men and women who would be the beginnings of the church. Same people who on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit would come upon them and the New Testament church would be born. Um, the church wasn't a building, wasn't a program that they were running. It was this group of people, men and women. We are the church. Back then, Jesus' followers, they were the beginnings, the first 
people that would begin this thing that you and I are a part of today called the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, spiritual family. And this is what Jesus says to them. He says to them, your love for one another, looking at this group of his followers, your love for one another will prove to the world. So he's saying, look look at each other, guys. Your love for each other is going to prove to all those people out there that are yet to, to find me, to believe in me, put their faith in me, will prove to them that you are my disciples. Your love for one another. In other words, turn away from the world for a moment. Take a good look at each other because your love for each other is the key that's going to prove to them that you're my disciples. So this is really the starting point for anything to do with outreach, mission, evangelism, is that followers of Jesus love each other. Now, this has been a bit of a theme through the last couple of Sundays a little bit, is that we've got to fall in love again with the bride of Christ, the church, the spiritual family that we're a part of. That's the starting point for anything else we do. Before we go anywhere or do anything, we need to have this foundation that we love each other. That's the launching pad. That's the starting point for anything else we do together, that we'd be a spiritual family of love. And, uh, you know, and this series has been about the dreamer, about dreams. You know, the best place for a dream to flourish and become a reality is within the context of a loving family. Did you know that? The best place, the best place for a dream to flourish, to be nurtured, to to become a reality is is for that dream to be shared, to be be, uh, uh, released in the context of a loving family. Now, we've come to know this as a family um, ourselves, firsthand. Uh, last year we had young Finn uh, come and he came and joined our family. Uh, seven-year-old boy um, has uh, been adopted into our family as, as one of us. And so the best thing, the, the goal that we've got to have is to provide a loving environment for Finn to, to grow up in. So that when Finn has a dream, when Finn has something that he's passionate about, something that he's excited about that, that, that drives him, that we would provide an environment where that would be nurtured, that that would grow and develop, that we would support him, encourage him, cheer him on. Do we get that right all the time? Absolutely not. In fact, I was up in Mount Cowley the other day and, and Finn said to me, you hate me. He said, you hate me. I said, why do I hate you? Because you make me come up this hill. <laughs> I said, no, I make you come up the hill because I love you. And sometimes love, it doesn't mean we always take the easy option, right? Some love is about pushing us and developing us and stretching us. And it doesn't seem like love at times. But when I got back from the UK, because um, Finn, he, he likes to do you know, crafts and things like that. He's good with his hands. And so, so I bought him this little model car thing back from the UK and, and he was just so excited to, to receive it and he spent the next two and a half hours just assembling this thing and putting it together and, and that's what it's about I knew that's what he was passionate about so I create the environment where he, can, where he can nurture that gift, nurture that ability and move towards his dreams the best place for dreams to become a reality is within the context of a loving family The other extreme for poor old Joseph, as we know the story of Joseph, as a teenager, is that he is is growing up in a family where everyone hates him. uh, He's got 12 siblings, is that right? One sister and 11 brothers, and they hate him. It says in in Genesis chapter um, 37 verse 4 that they hated him and they could not speak a kind word to him. So imagine that. You know, this is the environment. As a teenager, you're growing up with that, that any time you're around your brothers, your, your family, that, you know, they, they just haven't got anything kind to say. It doesn't say they didn't say anything. It just says that they didn't say anything kind. So when they did speak, it was always uh, sourced or rooted in hatred. 
So everything was hurtful. Everything they said was discouraging. It was harmful. It was destructive. There was nothing affirming, nothing life-giving, nothing that was edifying or building up Joseph. Even when he did have his dreams, he shares them, and, and it says that even his father rebuked him, told him to pull his neck in. And so we understand, you know, that uh, God had to remove him from within his own family. God had to get Joseph out of his family for his dream to become a reality. You know, so, so dreams, the best place for a dream to thrive is within the context of loving family. Um, last Sunday was really exciting for me. I could talk a little bit about dreams and, and uh, you know, allowing God to, to birth a dream in us. You know, we want to see our, our community impacted with the gospel. We want to make a positive difference in our world. And so God has got to ignite or birth a dream uh, about how that's going to happen. And so after church, you know, I was sort of people were lining up to say, look, I've got this dream. I've got this thing. I've got to share it with you. And so we're, we're saying, can we meet together? Can we sit down, have a coffee? Can I share this? And it was just so exciting to have that people. And, you know, and the really good thing is that they're saying, I've got this dream and I want to champion it. I want to champion this. So it wasn't like, I've got this dream, here you go, make it happen. It was, I want to carry this. I want to champion this. And so I'm looking forward. I haven't actually heard any of the dreams yet, but I'm excited in anticipation that, uh, you know, of hearing those dreams. But the level to which those dreams will flourish and become a reality will be determined or influenced by the level of love in this spiritual family. The level to which dreams will flourish will be determined or strongly influenced by the level of love in this family. I put it this way. The greater the level of love, the greater the opportunity for dreams to flourish. Yeah? The greater the level of love. You know, when we love someone, we'll support them, we'll cheer them on, we'll we'll want the very best for them. We will want them to succeed. And even if, you know, like we don't carry a dream ourselves, if we're part of a loving family and we hear someone else's dream, we'll say, hey, look, man, I, I, can I, is there any way I can share in this, support you, be a part of this? You know, I can give some time to this. You know, if, uh, like think about Kara. She's, uh, she's sort of like there's this dream of the playgroup. You know, this has been a long time coming, but now we're, we're moving towards that. And, and Kara is the champion of that dream. Wouldn't it be great if we, you know, like we will go around the car and say, look, Cara, I just love this dream that we want to make an impact in our community by touching the lives of parents and caregivers with, with preschoolers. Is there any way that I can support you in this, be a part of this, and I can just give a little bit of time? You know, the, imagine that, that Cara has got so many of us who are coming to her to say, look, can I be a part of it? That she's got to say, oh, actually, I got, I got more than enough people now, but I'll let you know. That would be great, wouldn't it? That's what a loving family is about. We get alongside each other. If we don't carry a dream ourselves, let's support someone else uh, into that, their dream that God's given them becoming a reality. The greater the level of love, the greater the opportunity for dreams to flourish. So what can affect, you know, coming back to love, what can affect our love for one another? You know, because the there are things that happen, you know, and, and can get in the way, come between uh, uh, loving relationships. Um, I, I like to be, be around new Christians, you know, people who are, uh, who've just come to faith because they just, uh, you know, there's so much passion. They're, they've just come into a revelation of all that God's done for them. You know, the revelation that, that, uh, of salvation, of eternal life, of forgiveness of sin, of a new beginning, a fresh start. And there's so much passion. They, they love God and they, they love the, the church that they're part of. You know, I, I've shared a little bit about Don. You know, I love uh, uh, before and Don, that moment where he came and he, he committed his life to Jesus. Myself and Garth stood with him. And, and from that moment, it was like he was just at everything. If the doors were open, Don was here. Prayer meetings, Bible studies, uh, services. He couldn't put his Bible down. He was just so in love with God, and he loved this family, the spiritual family he was a part of. 
And it's exciting. You know, being around people like that, it just uh, it stirs your own faith. It encourages your own, encourages your own heart. You know, I've never had a new Christian, a brand new Christian, come to me and say, man, I can't wait for 10 years' time when I'm cynical. Man, I'm just, I'm just looking forward to the day, you know, maybe 7 to 10 years from now where I've lost my joy, that I've got no passion left, man, that I'm negative and judgmental. Man, I'm looking forward to that day. <laughs> Have you ever heard a new Christian say that? No, we never begin the journey that way. We never start off. We start off, but then as we live our life, things happen. Things might be said or decisions made, and, and all of a sudden, you know, we get hurt or we get offended, disappointed. Uh, maybe we feel like we haven't been listened to. All these things happen in along the way, and all of a sudden, you know, we don't love like we once did. We're not as joyful as we once were because of the things that happen along the way. We get hurt. Disappointed, offended, maybe neglected, rejected, criticized. And all these things can affect our loving relationships, our love for our spiritual family, for each other as we look at each other. And, uh, you know, this has got to be dealt with. We're really serious about being a family of love. We've got to deal with some of the stuff that happens along the way. And, uh, and I think even over the last two years, there's been, there have been things that have happened over the last two years in the life of the church, not just this church, but the church, churches, decisions made, things said. Uh, people have been upset, hurt, felt rejected. I mean, we could go around the room right now, everyone in the room, and we could, uh, and we could all share about our, our scars, you know, the things that have happened. We could tell a story about what's happened over the last two years. But we can't live in the past. We've got to actually think, well, it's a new season. You know, this is a new day. How are we going to deal with some of that stuff? How are we going to get to a place where we are um, a loving family, a place where dreams thrive and come alive? Well, there's one word, one word, and it's uh, a word we all know. It's called forgiveness. Who's heard that word before? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Um, and this is, here's a verse from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And this is Paul. He's speaking to the, the church in Ephesus. He's speaking to the spiritual family. And he's talking in the context of love, of unity in, in the body. And he says this to them. He says, be kind and compassionate. That's a great start. You know, great thing. You know, great outward demonstration of love for one another is to be kind and compassionate. And then he says, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. You know, the, the last passage from the, the story of Joseph is all about forgiveness. You know, Joseph comes to the place, and, and I don't think it matters how his brothers came to him, or, or he was always going to forgive them. And if you look at the contrast of what his brothers, back when he was a teenager, they couldn't say a kind word to him they couldn't there was nothing kind coming out of their mouths the very last phrase in the story of Joseph says that Joseph spoke kindly to them forgiveness will always position us to be kind and compassionate Forgiveness will always position us to be kind and compassionate, which is demonstrations of love. And where Joseph could have had all this bitterness, all this stuff raging inside of him. Man, you know, I mean, he did, you know, like the journey. If you read the journey, he did sort of toy with them a little bit along the way, didn't he? He gave them a bit of a hard time, got them sweating a little bit from time to time. But but here he is. He's got no bitterness, nothing against his family, full of forgiveness and love. And he just wants to speak kindly to them. Just wants to be kind to his family. I want us to um, really see this and believe that this is a new day for SAJ as a church. An opportunity for us to grow in our love for one another. And so I've got a a prayer that I want us to have a look at this morning. And it's a real simple prayer. 
It's a prayer of forgiveness. And I want you to think about this prayer in terms of, especially the last couple of years, the journey, your own faith journey. And maybe, you know, like something's been said to you. Something, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, be honest with you, maybe as we've, as leadership team have made decisions over the last couple of years, maybe those decisions didn't line up with your thinking. And, uh, and, and so maybe, you know, like it's, uh, there's something that you're hanging on to. You're disappointed or there's hurt. Maybe there's a bit of offence there. You know, I certainly know that over the last couple of years there's been, there's been plenty of opportunity for people to feel rejected by the church, feel left out, sidelined. You know, the best thing we can do is not dwell in that. Bring it to God. Say, God, I want to move on. I don't want to be stuck in that place. I want to give this to God. I want to forgive that I can move forward into all that God has ahead for us as individuals and as a spiritual family. So the prayer says, Dear Heavenly Father, today I bring before you, and you put in the name or the names, people that, Maybe, you know, they've said something, they've done something. You just want to bring them to God this morning. You're going to say, I choose to forgive them for what did they do? What have you been hanging on to? I'm going to choose to forgive them for that. Please restore your love into this relationship right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. It's a simple prayer. But if we pray this prayer with sincerity and, and really mean it from our heart, I believe that God will just ignite the fires. He'll, he'll, he'll bring healing and He'll bring a fresh sense of love. You know, can you hear Jesus saying to us this morning? Love one another. That's going to prove to the world that you're my disciples. Love for one another. Look at each other and have love for one another. So just as the music prays, I'm going to sit down here and and I want you to pray this prayer. Not out loud. Please don't pray it out loud. Uh, Just pray this quietly and and bring, bring, uh, you know, the people, bring situations to God this morning. And we'll just take a couple of minutes to allow you to do business with God today. God bless you. morning we know that um, you're just such an incredible God that you can even as we've sat here and prayed you've heard every prayer in this room, you've heard our hearts Lord and the longing of your heart is to restore love 
is for this to be a, a spiritual family where we, we so love each other that, Lord, everyone who hears about it, everyone who gets close to this community of faith, know that we are disciples because of our love for one another. So as we've prayed these prayers of forgiveness, Lord, I pray that you restore love. Begin the journey of restoring where there needs to be restoration. Lord, let love prevail, I pray, in this spiritual family. As we move into this this season, uh, Lord, um, where we would believe that, Lord, you haven't finished with us yet. Greater things are on the horizon. Our best days as a church family are, are still before us in God. We believe that, God. Not because of anything we can do, but because of who you are and everything that you can do in us and through us. Stir our hearts, I pray. Help us to be a help us to be a room full of dreamers. That we'd dream big for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen.